We gastroenterologists have got a real problem because uh, unlike the cardiologist who's got a, a stethoscope and the thoracic physician who's got also a stethoscope and a chest x-ray, we're dealing with an organ which is completely dark inside and really isn't amenable, the 30 feet of length of the GI tract really isn't easily amenable to clinical examination. And really during the 60s and 70s, um, there was a great breakthrough in the sense that you could actually bring light, let there be light to the gastrointestinal tract. We had the development of this wonderful uh, piece of uh, engineering, the endoscope. And the endoscope could pass uh, through the foregut and through the colon, and we got actually very high quality pictures, and we could actually do some operations as well through that instrument. But colonoscopy isn't always that easy, and this is an example of what we see increasing as a patient with diverticular disease. Sometimes you're not even sure whether that's the lumen or whether it's the diverticulum, and it can be tricky, hazardous, and really quite uncomfortable for the patient. And in fact, there is quite a miss rate. If you think of it, you've got the headlights of your car, uh, and you know that you can only see within the range of the head where the headlights are shining. And this famous uh, uh, study that was done by two experts in the area, where th what they did is what are called back-to-back -back colonoscopies. So two experts followed each other. Each patient had two colonoscopies sequentially. They found that for these diminutive small polyps, uh, there was a, a miss rate between the two of that, that percentage slightly larger polyps, 13%, and even this guy who's really the doyen of American cardiologists, there was a 6% miss rate of uh, polyps that are greater than one. And these are hiding behind folds and can be very difficult to find. So um, I actually led this uh, audit, which has been alluded to before in the uh, couple of years, 10 years ago or thereabouts, looking at how good we are and found in fact that of all these colonoscopies and all these colonoscopists, um, at that stage, and it's changed considerably since then as a result of the audit and the change in the cycle, only about 20% of the units that were performing colonoscopy had a sequel intubation rate of 90%, which would be kind of the gold standard. So you don't always get to where you want to get to with a colonoscope, and that's even true now, although much less so with better training. And what do you find when you do colonoscopy in a bunch of symptomatic patients? Well, you find that 42% are normal, diverticulosis, polyps, but some of those polyps, and most of them are tiny, they're diminutive. They like freckles as opposed to moles, but about 22% in that study had, had polyps, most of which were small. IBD in some patients, and just note that <coughs> cancer is actually you know, quite rare, only 3.8% of these patients had cancer. So if you take the two together, normal and diverticulosis, which is part of the aging process, al almost, uh, say, 57, 60% of patients had what you would call a fairly normal colon. However, there are complications, and even with fantastic training available now, that we're still going to come across, and it doesn't matter how spectacular you are and how competent you are, there are complications. And in our study at that stage, there were um, 12 perforations in this group. Um, the overall perforation rate was 1 in 769. In eight of the 12 colonoscopies, the, it wasn't the polypectomy that caused the perforation, it was just the colonoscope going through the wall. And if you took therapeutic procedures alone, the perforation rate was 1 in 460, as opposed to 1 in 1,000 if there was no procedure. And indeed, that's what we usually quote to our patients, if there's no procedure, the perforation rate will be about 1 in 1,000. And there is actually, was in the study, also a mortality associated. There were 10 deaths within 30 days. In five of those patients, the colonoscopy was normal. And when looking through the notes, the colonoscopy was probably a fact in six out of the 10. This was within 24 hours, the patient had strokes, myocardial infarctions, etc. So uh, we quote the overall mortality rate related colonoscopy in the elderly population would be about, I wouldn't think it's that anymore, but it's probably in the region of one in 3,000, which is what we quote. So colonoscopy, you know, if you think of the UK as a whole, um, even using, you know, uh, the, the, even in an era where the training is much better, we'd expect about 500 perforations a year in the UK. We, there may be as many as, say, 300 deaths a year, and 55% of patients will have either normal endoscopy or, uh, or diverticulosis. Now, as painting a horror story of colonoscopy, and most patients come through it and whistle through it without any problems, but it's worth bearing in mind that if you take the population as a whole, this isn't an innocuous procedure, even in expert hands. 
So I think we have to always be asking ourselves the question, should we just sit where we are or should we move forward? And so I would just like to introduce you to the um, amazing era, digital era that we live in, where we use it in our pockets the whole time. We're using it on our, on our tablets and our desktops, so it's coming to medicine and what we do in a big way. So if you think of the old soothsayer in the Middle Ages, um, he or she would never have predicted ever in their wildest dreams that in the 1940s and 50s you'd be able to have a look into the patient's body using barium, barium. And that was the gold standard for many people remember here and still know today that barium enema was the magical way of actually investigating the colon. And the guys who pioneered barium studies and the radiologists uh, were mighty hurt and could never have believed that a 160 centimeter tube of fiber optics could be passed through the rectum through a colon which is five feet long, one and a half meters long, twisty and turny, and that you could get an instrument all the way to the ileocecal valve. You'd never have believed that. And we guys who do that sort of thing, a few years ago, perhaps 10 years ago, would never have believed that we could get vision without actually intubating the patient at all. And in fact, those of you who were and still are super, Superman uh, fans would remember one of the great things about Superman was X-ray vision. Um, he could see th right through people and he could see whether you were carrying a gun or a knife or in fact could see organs as well. And indeed the resolution of modern virtual colonoscopy in full colour is pretty fantastic. So that's what you would see done in endoscope and that's what you would see using virtual colonoscopy. So let me just tell you how the procedure is performed. Essentially all you really need is to insufflate some carbon dioxide into a prepared bowel. So the bowel is prepared in the usual way with one or two additions like um, a stool, stool tagging which I'll tell you a bit about in a moment. But there's a little machine which insufflates carbon dioxide which is warmed. Warm CO2 is insufflated through the rectum and the patient feels a little bit of distension but uh, certainly no pain. The patient then with a distended abdomen just passes through a CT scanner so there's a prone and a supine film taken and the very clever software reconstructs a virtual colonoscopy nowadays in three dimensions, 3D virtual colonoscopy. And this is what the uh, front end looks like. Unfortunately, as would happen, my slide uh, um, won't play in, in the slideshow, but I've got a YouTube video which I'll just show you the kind of quality that we can get if we could just show that quickly. This is coming straight off YouTube, but it's exactly the, the kind of picture you get. So if you just look over here, this is the radiologist, or for that matter, the gastroenterologist, because I've done a few of these myself. Um, this is really what you're doing, sitting with your little mouse and you're watching the lumen opening up in front of you. And you're basically traveling painlessly. The patient, of course, has long gone home and you're getting this quality and you're picking up little polyps along the line, which you can measure, etc. Just show that for a little while longer. Okay, thank you very much. If we go back to the slide. So um, uh, th there was a, a landmark study. Um, this was pu published in the New England Journal of Medicine by this guy who took 1,200 normal patients who they were going for screening. They had same day virtual colonoscopy and optical colonoscopy. And they had the 3D um, studies done. And you'll see that if you look at polyps, 10 millimeters, 8 millimeters, and 6 millimeters, virtual colonoscopy and optical colonoscopy are pretty similar. So you have, in screening terms, fantastically similar um, comparisons. Um, virtual colonoscopy diagnosed uh, two cancers, OC1 cancer and optical colonoscopy was 12 polyps. So in other words, the virtual colonoscopy in that trial was a little bit more sensitive than optical colonoscopy. Um, we've done a study which was slightly different. We took 100 symptomatic patients. These are screening. These are the patients you sent to us. And they had the same thing. They had a virtual colonoscopy called V3D followed by optical colonoscopy. The colonoscopist was blinded. But if they missed something, if it's been seen on the CT, they were told by a nurse that they'd missed it. They went looking. And essentially, uh, they came with the usual kinds of things that you send out patients for us to investigate. And uh, the 
preparation is a low residue diet, a little bit of barium the day before, a laxative, usually movi prep, uh, in the same way for colonoscopy. And these are the kind of pictures that the radiologist, this is what's co called electronic cleansing. You'll see here there's a puddle of fluid. You might miss something under there, but it's, got, it's, it's tagged with gastrographin. And with electronic cleansing, it's very easy to clean the colon. That's just an example of that. And these are the kind of findings you can observe. So this was the comparative trial. Virtual colonoscopy took the same amount of time. The completion rates in virtual colonoscopy were very high, and the complication rates were minimal in both sides. These are, are small polyps. These are middle-sized polyps, and these are the large polyps. These are things that we're looking for. And in the trial of symptomatic patients, if you look over here, this is virtual colonoscopy, optical colonoscopy. Three cancers were picked up in both. For polyps greater than 6 millimeter, 11 polyps in 9, 10 polyps in 9, but this one was found on looking again. And so overall, uh, you can see that the two-level peg in symptomatic patients for all these findings. So very good sensitivity for cancer and probably 10% better sensitivity for larger polyps. So just to finally kind of give you a sense of what this could mean in clinical practice for the NHS, virtual colonoscopy costs half the price of colonoscopy in terms of tariff which interests GPs that our hospital doesn't like that idea at all, but there you go. If you take 100 patients with colonic symptoms, these are the patients you sent to us, and they all had virtual 3D virtual colonoscopy, there would be a total of 20 patients who would need colonoscopies, either because you found something that was obviously abnormal, or there were false positives. In other words, you, it was reported as positive, and you went in and you, found, you couldn't find it, either because it was hiding away or because it was a bit of stool. 36 patients who have diverticulosis who wouldn't go on to have a colonoscopy at all. And these little diminutive polyps or freckles, uh, where there may not be any need to go in and intervene in a big way for the patients, you could follow them up later or reconsider the diagnosis. And of course, as already mentioned, the, you find lots of other things. In fact, you find more extraclonic cancer than you find cancer. So if you're doing a surveillance program in patients with virtual colonoscopy for colon cancer, you actually find more renal cancer, pancreatic cancer, et cetera, than you do colon cancer. And therefore, in my view, if you're going to screen the colon, maybe you should screen everything. Why just screen the colon? There's an argument around that. So I think that the future is send out the drone, and I think this is for medicine in general, send out the drone, which is looking, and which is minimally invasive, and then when you find the perpetrator, then you send in the um, targeted colonoscopist who's highly skilled at dealing with the abnormality. And just finally, to leave you with the idea that, you know, our patients who have uh, virtual colonoscopy are generally, they quite like the experience by comparison, especially if they've had a colonoscopy before. The doctor feels a bit happier because the complication rates are pretty much zero. There's never been a complication in the modern era from virtual colonoscopy, like perforation. And of course, um, you know, the, the nursing staff who have to look after the patient will be happier as well. So I just leave you with the notion that um, things are changing and perhaps the most interesting new change that goes even beyond this is capsule colonoscopy, which is part of the era of, of capsule endoscopy. There's now a colon capsule. And in our place, we've done about 100 colon capsules. And this is where the patient swallows a capsule, goes home and brings back the, uh, the receiver the next day having passed the colon capsule in, in the toilet, and you just sit in front of your PC at home, actually looking at their colonoscopy, uh, painless and extremely helpful and very sensitive. Thank you very much.